Good morning. Hi. It's been almost three weeks since George Floyd, an African-American man, was brutally killed by a police officer kneeling on his neck for nearly nine minutes in Minneapolis. The horrific murder of George has resulted in protests across all 50 states, not just in response to this murder, but in response to the decades and the centuries of widespread racial injustice that is endemic in Western society towards black and ethnic minorities. As you all know, protests have erupted in cities across the UK, including in our own city of Bristol, where last Saturday, the statue of the slave trader, Edward Colston, was torn down and thrown into the harbour. We suspect and hope that we are in the midst of a historic moment when we will witness dramatic changes to the deep-seated racial injustice experienced by black and ethnic minorities, not just in the US, but here in the UK, here in Bristol. The Reverend Al Sharpton, a central figure in America's civil rights movement, put it more succinctly in a rallying cry at the Minneapolis Memorial Service for Floyd last Thursday. White America, he said, needed to get off our neck. The reason we could never be who we wanted and dreamed of being is you kept your knee on our neck. He cried to shouts of agreement. We could do whatever anyone else could do, but we couldn't get your knee off our neck. What happened to Floyd happens every day in this country in education and health services and in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. Undoubtedly, what is a reality in the US is reflected in the UK and especially in Bristol. A study in the Runnymede Trust, by the Runnymede Trust rather, in 2017, found that Bristol's black and ethnic minority communities have poorer job prospects, worse health, and the fewest academic qualifications than those in white communities of the 10 core cities in the UK. Friends, the horrific murder of George Floyd and many others like him is a tragic wake up call to us all, particularly those of us in the white majority, to reflect on our own complicity in perpetuating the racism that sustains unjust white privilege in our nation. Justice is at the heart of the gospel of Jesus and is central to what makes us human. The prophet Micah summarizes this saying, to be human is to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We believe that the most appropriate first response to this wake up call is to pay attention and listen to the voices of the black and ethnic minorities. Claire and I feel we have much to learn. And perhaps if you are part of the white majority here in the UK, you might feel the same. Lasting change and an end to racism will only happen if we all take responsibility for our own ignorance and bias. If we don't come to a personal understanding of our own deep seated prejudices, then we cannot collectively change as a society. To help us with this, we have invited two of our friends to share their experiences and perspective. Before we talk to them, can I suggest that you join us during these next few weeks in spending some time watching, listening and reading more about racism and asking God to show us our blind spots. There's some resources on the website, including the book, We Need to Talk About Race by Ben Lindsay. It's about four pounds on Amazon. And there are some short videos and articles that you can watch and read as well. But now let's talk to Sarah Dodd and Miles Connor. Thank you, Sarah and Miles, for joining us today. It's so lovely to be with you. Um, can we just start by you just telling us a little bit about um, your background and your story? Oh, um, Sarah, why don't you start off? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I was born and raised in Ghana um, and moved here when I was 13. So both my parents are Ghanaian. And I moved here with my, my mom was here originally and my mom, and my sister, my dad and I moved here about 10 years later to join my mom in the UK so we could have better educations, I guess. Um, and we've lived in Western Supermare the entire time we've been in the UK and um, moved to, I came to Bristol for my post-grad and so I've stayed in the same area sort of for most of the time I've been in the UK and I'm a student here as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. 
That's great. That's great. And Miles, how about you? Yeah, so, um, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm from a mixed heritage background. So um, my dad is um, half Jamaican, half English. Uh, my mum is half Nigerian, half English. Both of my parents were born and raised in London. Um, and so, yeah, um, me personally, I am, well, I'm a police officer. Um, I've worked for Avon and Somerset Police for four years since I moved to, since I moved to Bristol. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And you've just become a dad. Oh yeah, and I've just become a dad. <laughs> which is awesome. Which is awesome. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, guys. That's great. Would you would you tell us uh, about your experience of being treated differently because of the colour of your skin growing up and now? And Miles, how about you first? Yeah, fun always. Um, so yeah, so for me, it's it's, um, it's definitely been a uh, a mixture. Um, I think my experiences would differ slightly from someone um, from from someone who is fully black um, or, f or fully white, for that matter. But my yeah, my my experiences would differ um, in the sense that I've I've experienced racism from both groups um, for not necessarily being black enough in certain areas um, uh, or my skin not being dark enough. Um, but mainly, um, I've experienced racism because of my African and my Caribbean heritage. Um, and so like throughout my, my youth, like growing up, um, that I, yeah, there's, there's loads of times where, for example, I'd, I'd go into shops um, and security guards would follow me around the shop. Um, and this was, and, it, and for me, this was, this was even when I'd go with my white friends um, and, they, and they would make a comment about it and, and, and they would be like, Miles, that security guard is following us. And they, they would know it's because they was hanging out with me that day. Um, and I've, I've had experiences with where I've been stopped by police officers. Um, and now being a police officer, I understand what the legislation says and what, my, um, and what they are supposed to say to me when they stop and search me. Um, and they didn't give me a reason why they were stopping me. Um, um, I had a uh, cocoa butter in, which is like a, for, for those who don't know, you use cocoa butter to cream your skin. Um, and I had that in my, in my bag and the, the police officer, he opened it and he was like, oh, what's this? And he sniffed it as if it was some kind of like, almost like he thought it might've been a, like, I might be hiding drugs in there or something like that. He didn't really give me any explanation why he was stopping me. Um, so yeah, and then there was there was other occasions where I'd been stopped stopped by the police, and I was walking home, and I was walking home from church uh, with one of my white friends, um, and he said he'd never been stopped by the police in his life, um, and that was the first time he'd ever been stopped by the police, and it happened to be the time that he was walking home with me. Um, yeah, there's been time I've been called there's there's things I won't I won't I won't repeat fully, but I've been called black a black so and so. Um, and at times I, growing up, I didn't respond to it in the right way. Um, and I responded negatively and I fought because for me, that was what I thought was the right thing to do to stand up for myself. I look back on it, um, and I look back on it with regret a lot of time. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been, um, there's been loads and loads of experiences when I've been with my other black friends where, you know, we've been, you know, we was, I remember time we was walking down the street and, you know, this, this, this lady pointed to us and said, oh, look, it's the whistle kicks. Um, and some people might think that that's a joke. Some people might think that's acceptable. Um, but for us, that was because we are black, because we are of an ethnic minority, you think that she thought it was acceptable for her to say that. Um, as it, and it wasn't, we didn't find it funny at all. Um, it, we, we found it offensive. Um, and so, yeah, these are some of, definitely some of the experiences that I've experienced um, growing up. And even still um, to this day, I, I know that, I, I still feel that I need to make sure I get a receipt out of the shop just in case um, the security guard stops me as I'm going out of the shop. And that's as a man, as a police officer, I still feel like I have to, make sure I get my receipt out of fear that I might be stopped when I, when I walk out. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of, that's my experience of, of racism. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Wow, thank you. And Sarah, how about you? Um, so obviously growing up in Ghana, my race was never an issue because everyone looked like me. It was never a thing till I moved here. And 
I joined a school where I was the two black people, including me, but I never saw the other person. And what I it started off as ignorance, just asking me strange questions like whether I lived in a tree or something like that. And for the most part, I brushed it off as they don't know. And a lot of this to do with dedication system, not teaching those kind of things. But then as I started to get older, the biggest one was when I started, I got my first job as a healthcare assistant in the NHS and having to deal with patients, just saying every racial slur in the world. I don't know where they learn it from, but hearing patients constantly saying racial slurs being just generically racist to you and also having that feeling of being alone because your colleagues that you're meant to work as a team with doing nothing not stepping in or sometimes hearing them laughing about it when they think you're not listening and having to like deal with that of isolation of no one was for you and no one was going to step in to help you and then there have been slightly minor cases the microaggressions of coming after features that were are predominantly black like having an afro hair and being told it was not professional even though it's in a tight bun or um it was a little things but when when you're trying to explain how it's hurtful to you you're sort of um told it's in your head and to get over it and it's sort of like a bit of a gaslighting happening where no one wants to believe that this happens to you because if they haven't seen it it didn't happen or to them it's not considered racist so having to deal with that a lot and it wasn't until I went to uni that I actually had other black friends because I've always been in predominantly white areas to like have someone to finally speak to about it like that oh wait it didn't just happen to me alone and it's a kind of a universal experience so yeah that was strange Wow. Great. Well, thank you both of you for sharing that. that that's really helpful. Um, can you tell us uh, how you've been affected by George Floyd's death and the public response to it since? Um, Sarah, why don't you start? Um, I think it was something that affected. So every black person felt some kind of anguish from this because um, it's also well known that most black communities are very well, are very close and very tight. And so it was seen like your own brother, your own father, a family member, or it could have been you that was in that video. And it was it brought up a lot of trauma for a lot of minorities and black people who feel like they've been through something similar and just feeling that helplessness of not mattering as much where someone can confidently just do something that bad to you with no care for repercussions or anything because they really feel like you're not worth that much that they'll get in trouble for and a lot of people looked at that video saw themselves saw their people they love in that video and it sort of just brought up a lot of emotions and trauma and this is not the first time we've seen a video like this and it's like that constant reminder so it's been happening for years. We see these videos all the time and nothing gets done. And then we just get more and more helpless, more and more hurt every time we see it. And it was just, I don't know, there was something about this one that was really a tipping edge for a lot of people, I think. Thank you, Sarah. Miles, what about you? What was your response? Yeah, still to this day, I haven't, I haven't watched the video. I can't. Um, I've seen clips of it. I've seen images of it. Um, but I, I can't bring myself to watch it. Um, to the, I've heard that the, he, he was calling out for his mum. And, and for me, that, that's what we, we, you see in that situation, something's gone wrong there that, you know, he, he lost this, just the, the value in him, the, the sense of humanity in him just disappeared at that moment. Um, because he's, he, a man is, on, is on, on his last breath calling out for his mum and he's in fear. Um, and his, his life is about to end and for me I, I couldn't bring myself to watch it and like Sarah said there's been too many videos of this where where and, and for me it, I know that in my heart it would stir up a response that I don't want in my heart um, which would would be anger um, and so I, I chose not to watch it um, 
for years we've seen stories like this and nothing has been done about it. Um, and I'm not saying that it's every, so for example, like for myself, I'm a police officer. Um, I'm not saying that every single police officer, I, do, I don't believe the narrative that every single police officer is, is a racist. I don't believe necessarily that um, the, the institution itself is racist. Um, I believe that there are racist individuals in the police force. Um, and that's across the world because there's racist individuals in the world. Um, and that's, that's the situation that we have there. Um, in terms of the public response to it, uh, a, lot, a lot of people have said that, well, they're not sure whether it was racially motivated, they're not sure whether, but, but, but for me, we've seen too many incidences like this for it to not be the reason. Um, and the fact that it's 2020, and we're still seeing things like this happen today. I believe that's why we have got the response that we've got. Um, and people are tired. The black community are tired of, um, of this happening again and again and again and again. Um, what, and and I, I believe it's, it's, it's been a build-up. I think we saw the response after, after Brexit, where there was an increase in hate crime. Um, in our communities and so so for me i, I believe there's, there's definitely been a build-up over the years and this has become just an, an outpouring of the of the of like what you were saying the emotions people are tired and had enough um a lot of people have said that it's not um an issue in the uk um i like to um bring us back to quite recently the windrush scandal which happened um, for um, the Caribbean community where they were invited over here to work. Um, I know people personally that were affected by this and were threatened with deportation um, because they, hadn't, they didn't have supposed British citizenship. Although they've been in the country for 50, 60 years, um, paid taxes, um, worked, worked here for the whole of that time, um, and then were threatened with deportation. So for me to, to say that we don't have an issue here is, is a bit, um, is naive. Um, and that, that was in 2018. Um, people will say that there's reparations that have been made because of that. That's, that's not fully the case. Yeah, they can apply for um, citizenship. However, for me, I believe that they should be given British passports. Um, they, they've been here since they were very young, some of them and don't have any connection to their Caribbean nations. And so they're British, they're, you know, by culture and by nature, they're British. Um, they're, the color of their skin just happens to be slightly different. Um, and as well as um, the Windrush scandal this year, racism in football for me has been absolutely crazy. If, if, a, if a black player misses a penalty, then if you look at the comments on social media, it's disgusting. Um, and it's heartbreaking that in 2020, we're still having the same conversation um, that we've had um, for years on end. Um, with regards to the protest, I'm, I, I'm, I'm all for it. I think I, I, I totally understand people are saying, well, coronavirus. Um, but for me, I, I, I think it just shows you how desperate people have become um, in this time and that it is, it is a massive issue. And, and those are just a couple of examples of where we still do have issues um, in the UK. Even though this incident happened in the States, um, we've definitely still got issues in the UK. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, man. Well, we would love you to talk to us about what we can learn as a community. Um, uh, what can we learn as a community? Because obviously being part of a predominantly white church, um, what's your experience like? What can we learn together as a community? Uh, Miles, how about you first? Yeah, I, I, I believe that racism is, so for me, the way that I've overcome it is that racism for me is a social construction. We need to educate ourselves on this and that needs to be put into our schools and our education systems. Sarah said in, in Ghana, she wasn't viewed as a black woman. She was viewed as a woman. It wasn't until she came here where race has been socially constructed as, as an idea that we have, that is, that is where the issue, that is the issue that we have. More education needs to be done around this and to recognize that actually people have been put into categories. It's only when I fill out a form, do I have to pick out whether I'm black, white, mixed, or they don't actually have a box for me. Um, because I, 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 I'm, oh, I'm, I'm mixed Caribbean and I'm mixed Af African. There's not a box for me. Um, and we need to educate us. And that's, that's for me, that's the ultimate um, answer to the, to the issue. 
and that's going to take time. It's not going to be something that happens overnight. Um, but I, I, I also think that um, the church is a massive, massive part to play in it as well. Um, and, and your question about being in a predominantly white church, like even growing up, um, there was I had a tight community in our church where it was it was very mixed. So we had a lot of white people, we had a lot of black people, and do you know. What, Growing up, we it, the church was very different to, to Vineyard, um, in the sense that yeah, because it, there was it was it was more multicultural. Um, there was different expressions of worship, um, and so like for me, we did um, a lot of Christian hip hop and Christian rap, and that was accepted in the church, and that was a massive part. And and our youth worker at the time, he was a white Englishman, but he he pushed us for that. He he recognised that that was a part of our culture. And we wanted to use it to express our love and our passion for Jesus. And, and, he, was, and, he, and he pushed that. And there were some people in the church that didn't like it and actually left the church because me and my brother were on stage rapping about Jesus. Um, and so there are definitely still issues within our church community. However, um, I, as I said, there was, a, there was a good core of young black Christians at, at, at the church. And that was massive for me. But also, I didn't see them any different to, to the white Christians. We were family. And that's one thing that didn't, when I look back on it, it's not something that came up. We didn't really talk about it because I didn't look at anybody any different. We were family. We looked after each other. We prayed for each other. And I feel the same about Vineyard, to be honest. I don't come into, I, I want to be a part of a church that's passionate for Jesus. I don't want to be a part of the church. And this is one place I believe that we, the, the, the conversation kind of goes quiet. And rightly so, because we're there to serve God and we're there to serve Jesus. And a part of that is, learning about our communities and, and the struggles that they're going through and how we can support and love them through it. But I don't, Vineyard is an amazing church and, I, and, and not, to, not to be, but it is. And the, the work that we do with the Syrian communities, it's a church that looks out and the fact that we're sitting here having this conversation shows um, that the church is amazing. And I, from the moment that I've walked into the church, I felt welcomed, I felt loved. Um, and I know that the church has got a heart for God and a heart for Jesus, and that's, and that's what we want. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Miles. Sarah, how about you? Um, so, being in this country, I've always been in predominantly white churches. And I think what one of the biggest draws for me to that church was how they received their minority congregation. So, because um, it always mattered if I was, because I like being black. I've always been proud of being black. So it's more of like, I want you to see me as black, but enjoy the experience of me being black and appreciating what I have to offer. And I think one of the biggest ways to do that is to obviously, just as Mal said, education. I think a lot of the way history is taught in this country deletes a lot of information that I feel is quite necessary. And growing up in Ghana, I didn't have the luxury of not knowing anything about the British Empire or the or colonialism because I still feel the effects of it today. And it's more about we open these discussions. It's race shouldn't be an uncomfortable subject. It should be open and say, oh, I see your difference, but I want to see what you have to offer and God created us different for a reason. There's a blessing in diversity and ha everyone having a different strength and a different talent to bring together to create the body of Christ. And so I think in white churches that allow these conversations to happen, that actually encourage the display of the different cultures, like having events where people can really come together to see each other's way of life. is a really good way for that to happen. Reach into your community, speak to people, um also just be an open forum just let it be known that you are here to listen when someone wants to talk and instead sort of being silent about issues because i have friends in churches where this is not allowed to be spoken about so for this church to reach out and say we want to hear is such a great thing i was speaking to my friends about it like oh wow <laughs> and they were surprised that like it was something that was asked to be spoken about. And so I think that's where the church is getting it right to so that, yes, you have minorities in your church and that is not a bad thing. Let's enjoy that and celebrate that diversity and learn from each other. 
and I think that's the only way to go with it. Oh, no. Yeah, we agree. Thank you. Well, bless you guys. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing your stories and your perspectives with us because it is so, so powerful and so helpful. Mm. And we just wonder whether it'd be okay if you would just lead us in prayer um, just at the end of this conversation, uh, praying that the Holy Spirit would, would be in the center of what we're doing. Um, Sarah, would you like to start that and, and Miles pick up and then perhaps one of us? Okay. Let's pray. So Father, hello. <laughs> so, Father Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us today. I know the world is not in the greatest place at the moment but we want to highlight the room that you've given us the grace you've given us to explore the beauty and diversity that you've given us and i want you to just bless the lord and bless people's bless people's hearts bless people's minds that they'll be receptive to learning about other people and their experiences father we ask you to give us the knowledge on how to pursue this in the most gracious and most loving way possible. We do not want this to be an issue of contention, an issue of divide. We want you to open people's eyes to see that this beauty in the creation that you have made and that this issue is not a political issue, but rather a God issue, a mm -hmm. human issue, that your body is being divided and we need to come together in order to be more effective. And Father Lord, we bless the work that you've already done in stirring people's hearts and that we pray that this will continue to go on this is not something that will just end in a week but something that will continue a movement that will continue to stir people's hearts the church will continue to support people and be an open space for people of all creeds of all religion of all faiths that will come together and know you lord that they will know that you provide the love and the only place where we can we know that we're safe and Father Lord, we hope that you'll continue to let your work flourish and that we'll also hold each other accountable in a loving way, in a godlike way, that we can do your work and where people's skin is not an issue and that there is beauty in what you've made. Yeah, yeah Father, I just um I thank you just for the opportunity just to have this conversation. Um and I just pray, Lord, for healing um, for those that have been affected by everything which has gone on. Um, I, I pray, Lord, that this is an opportunity where um, the church rises up and finds a solution to our ongoing separation and division in our societies. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you just unite us and bring us together. Um, and just, yeah, Lord, I just pray that you just keep this conversation on our lips and allow it to just become something which is a normality um, for us to constantly look at and just review and say actually where are we at um, in our in our societies in our in our businesses and in, in, in our in our workplaces lord um, and yeah lord I, I, I just pray that um, this is the start of a new season lord and a new era um, where we do see um, change in our society um, and a change, change for the better. Um, in your name we pray, amen. 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 Yeah, and Father, just thank you for um, Sarah and Miles this mm. morning, for them sharing, and I just feel ask your blessing on them both. And thank you for their vulnerability. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would work in each of our hearts um, just to uh, hear what you are saying to us and what you've been saying to us this morning through Sarah and Miles. Um, let us not miss anything and I ask Holy Spirit that you would do deep work in us in us personally in us as a church in us as a community that your kingdom would come yeah. that your kingdom would come that the unity that all that you have created would be seen and would be lived out mm. that we are all your children we are all made in your image we are all one family and we are all loved by you yeah. and i pray that that would be a reality that we would know not just in our heads but in our hearts and we would see our work throughout our whole community our whole nation and this whole world yeah. we don't want to stop fighting for this until we see racism come to an end mm. 
Holy Spirit, come, let your kingdom come. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. Guys, thank you so much for sharing thank with us this morning. We're so grateful to you. I thank you for your vulnerability and your honesty. Um, we're going to bring our interview to an end this morning, but we would invite you if you would like some prayer. Um, maybe just some of the stuff we talked about today has just really resonated, hit a nerve. It's just connected you to a part of your past or your present that you want to just pray through with someone then the, go to our prayer lounge in a moment there's going to be people there ready and willing and waiting to pray with you um, but for now thank you so much sarah thank you miles and we'll speak to you later take care thank you